Okay. Okay, well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kathleen Donovan, and I have the great privilege of working at the Arlington Public Schools Special Education Parent Resource Center. And I'm here with my colleague, Kelly Mountain, who will say hi in just a moment. But we just wanted to thank Ann Dolan for joining us tonight again. She came last Wednesday and she was so very popular um, that we needed to schedule a second session. So we're really glad for the interest of our families and our community. And we're very, very grateful to Ann for her expertise and knowledge. I know I learned a lot um, just watching this last week and I'm anxious to watch it again and many of our families are working so hard to support their learners at home and we really appreciate you giving us your guidance and expertise. Kelly's going to just tell you a little bit about how you can reach the Parent Resource Center if you need us. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Kelly Mountain and um, again, thanks to you, Anne, and thank you to all of our parents that are supporting their kids. I know it's a challenging time. Um, if you need anything, although our PRC isn't open for live time, we are very open virtually. So we will put our contact information in the chat, but we are available to meet with parents either on the phone or in a little teleconference. Um, and we'll be continuing to provide some uh, learning opportunities over the course of the year as well. So again, welcome and, and thanks again. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's always a pleasure to work with the Parent Resource Center. It's such a great resource for families um, throughout Arlington County. All right, so let's get started. And if you'd like, I will turn off your video. Oh, there you go, Kelly. So you don't have to worry about being seen the whole time. Um, so welcome, my name is Ann Dolan. And um, as Kelly and Kathleen mentioned, this is actually our second webinar for Arlington County Public Schools. And um, I'm particularly interested in this subject because I saw what havoc virtual learning created in, in March. Fortunately, for the most part, it's gotten better since then. But what I'm here to share with you tonight is that it can even be better with some new strategies. I will share a lot of information with you tonight. And in addition, I've created an ebook um, called Six Tips for Smoother At-Home Learning, even when you're dreading it. And it's actually a fantastic resource of about 14 pages with lots of strategies for you, any kind of learner of any age. And you can get that very simply by texting 55444 and just type in the word virtual. Um, there's also resources on my website, which is called ectutoring.com. And if you go to my blog, you can find lots of very detailed um, articles about things that we'll talk about tonight. But again, that ebook is just text 55444 and the word virtual. All right, so um, here's what we're gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna talk about the two ways you can set up for a designated workspace um, for your kids and tweak what you have if it's not going as well as you had anticipated. And along the way, um, we'll learn new ways to keep kids focused, not just now, but throughout the year. We'll discuss routines and structure because these are really the backbone of our day-to-day -day survival, making sure that our kids are on task and, and they're following through. And then lastly, and most importantly, we'll talk about relationships with our kids. You know, it's really hard right now. Uh, we're around our kids all the time. And we think that we're spending lots of time with them and we are, but there are even some other ways that we can tweak it just a bit so we um, remain neutral, we don't get into power struggles with our kids, and this is especially important when we're working from home and we have the added stress of um, also trying to make this all work within our, within our household. So let's get started and um, talk about what it used to look like back in March. Here it was. Here was our teacher in front of our students. She made sure that our kids were paying attention, that they were doing their work, and if they had a hiccup along the way, she was able to help them because she could see all of them in one place. But here's how it is now. We've got a Zoom room with lots of kids in it, and it's harder for parents, or for teachers, I'm sorry, to know how kids are doing. It's harder to know, do you get the skill? Um, are you paying attention? Are you following through? It's harder for kids to do things like ask for help when they're struggling, and it's harder for us as parents to know when our kids do need help and how they're doing overall. So there are certainly things that we can do to make it all easier at home. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Now, that really starts with setting up an ideal workspace in our home for our kids. And there's two ways you can, you can do this. You may have already done one of these ways, but let's talk about both of them real quick. 
So the first one is an individual desk, or it could be an old card table that you drag up from the basement. It doesn't have, anything, have to be anything special, but this is just where your child does work day in and day out. Now, it should be a place that's quiet, but not too quiet. So for an elementary school student, for example, you wouldn't want to squirrel your, say, seven-year-old second grader away into an um, upstairs guest bedroom and you're working on the first floor because that's going to seem very quiet and less distracting. The truth is, for younger kids, when it's too quiet and too isolating, they're actually a little bit more distracted. So in general, for young children, make sure that the location is within earshot from you. For your elementary kids, the bedroom is not ideal. It might be a privilege later on if your child can prove that they're doing a really good job, they're getting good grades, um, you're getting favorable uh, feedback from the teacher, you don't have to correct them a lot, they're able to stay focused, maybe you can consider it then. But for most kids, even middle schoolers, I'd make sure that they're doing their work initially in a place where you can check in every now and then. So here's the other way. Um, now, this is more realistic for many of our households because we just don't have the space for all of our kids to have individual desks. However, we usually have one large table we can put all of our kids at. So we might have three of our kids working at, say, a kitchen table or um, it could be a dining room table. If that is the case, we want to make sure they have some type of visual barrier. Otherwise, they'll drive each other crazy. So you can do this very inexpensively. You can go to Michael's or some other craft store and buy one of those science project three panel fold outs. You can also go on a teacher's website. This one is from um, Lakeshore Learning. Also really good stuff has them. They have them on Target too. These are testing carols for kids. Um, we use these in schools all the time. So these also provide a visual barrier. But whatever way you do it, let your child make this their own space. It should feel warm and cozy. They should be able to decorate it like they like. And if you notice pages here, she also has her schedule for the day, which we'll talk about in a second, because that's actually super important. Now, we want to make sure our kids are equipped for success in other ways. This goes without saying, I know we all know this, but you'd be surprised how many kids don't have a great Wi-Fi connection in the space they're at. If this has been you know, not great for you in the last week, I'd consider maybe changing up the space to make sure it's solid. Think about your child's seating. It might not be that the dining room table chair is really comfortable for your child. If you've got a fidgety kid, they might, be, they might do de better on a ball chair. This looks like an exercise ball, but it actually has a flat platform to sit on. Make sure ch your child has noise canceling earphones. Speaking of this, if you have all your kids at one table and then you have a child in asynchronous learning where maybe they're listening to their teacher and talking or chatting with this small group and it's kind of noisy, have a backup location for them to go so that they're not disrupting the other kids at the table. A student planner, they need a place to write down their work, especially their homework from day to day. For younger kids, it's usually paper and pencil. For older kids, they'll use something in the Google Classroom suite um, because they like to do it electronically. And then lastly, consider a clock so that your child knows what time it is. But research shows us that actually an analog clock is better than a digital clock, like the one kids just look at on their phone, because the hands move. And these hands help kids understand elapsed time, how much time has passed, and about how much time they have before the next thing. So I like the idea, if you happen to have an analog clock somewhere else in your house, bring it around to your child's study area and make sure they're referencing that to get a better sense of time. Who couldn't use better time management skills? Some other helpful supplies, not required, but kind of nice to have. The first thing is an accordion binder. I personally am a huge fan of accordions. I used to have kids, in high school, have a small three ring binder for every class, not anymore. They just don't have the paper flow. I'd have elementary schoolers get a trapper keeper um, that has an accordion and then these also these big three rings. Not anymore, they don't really need a hole punch, but they do need a place for the papers that they get. Not a lot, but they need an organized system. So with an accordion, you can label each tab as the subject 
And whenever your child gets a paper, or maybe they have an interactive notebook or a composition book, and they're done with it, they put it to the back. That way, everything in that section is chronologically organized. Also, <laughs> this, this seems so simple, but we found in my business, um, we work with kids all the time, day in and day out. We help them to do better in school. A lot of the kids we see need help with executive functioning skills, meaning they could be a little bit more organized. They could maybe manage their time better, have some better study habits, those types of things. They're called executive function skills. Um, they were inevitably, inevitably in the spring saying things like, oh, what's my password for that site? Um, oh, I can't remember my username. They didn't really have a system to keep track of all this information. So I always recommend to kids and all of our tutors or coaches have kids do this, keep a, a post-it note, a three by five card, anything, to write down all the URLs you're gonna need, the usernames and the passwords. Oh, other things that are kind of nice to have, kids like highlighters, I like highlighters, but they like erasable highlighters even more. So when they learn something, um, when they're learning something, they can highlight it, and when they know it, they can erase it. Same with colored pencils. I love the erasable kind, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, um, what, oh, I forgot to ask my first question. I knew I'd forget something like this along the way, hold on. So here's my first question. Um, I'm curious, what is your child's grade level? So if you could go in right now and vote, either pre-K, K, for a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or high school, that would be helpful for me. Interesting. Thank you, everybody, for voting. Wow. Okay, great. It looks like we have more third and fourth graders than any other grade level. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. I was on a webinar a couple weeks ago, and um, it was for elementary, middle, and high school, and probably 90% of the parents on it had pre-K and K. <laughs> so I thought, you know what, from now on, I'm going to ask. So thank you for sharing that. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, focus next. So here's my next question to you. I'm curious. So when it comes to... Um, when it comes to focus, is focus an issue for your child? I'm wondering, yes, it's a huge issue. Sometimes it depends on the subject, or no, not at all, my child's super focused. I'm wondering which one, if you could pick one, that would be helpful. Great, thank you. Interesting, nobody said not at all, my child is super focused. <laughs> Okay, but we have a lot of people, most people said sometimes depends on the subject, and then that was followed by yes, it's a huge issue. All right, thank you for that. So we know it's an issue for sure. Um, let me share these results with you. Interesting, thank you. So that's not a surprise. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we do in that case. So when our kids are struggling with focus, it's often at a time when they have to pay attention to the teacher, or maybe she's giving a lecture or going through a PowerPoint and it's direct instruction, but your child's also in a Zoom room of lots of kids. So how do they keep focus? One thing that we found is redirecting doesn't really help. So when we as parents say, pay attention, look at your teacher, it might work for like 20 seconds, but Kids don't stay focused. So what do you do in those cases? Well, um, a couple things, but the first is that we wanna make sure they have fidget tools right in their hand. Fidget tools are the funniest thing. I love fidget tools personally, but I found that when, and in, in research backs this too, when kids that are fidgety have something to touch and play with and they feel that pressure, they're better able to focus. So here are a couple that work. This is the, actually the, the, one of the best selling fidgets on Amazon. It's basically a mesh bag with a marble inside of it. So go figure, kids just move the marble with their fingers and they love it. We grew up with Silly Putty, but this is a new modern version of this fidget tool and it's called Neato. We all know fidget spinners. And then lastly, wiggle feet are great sensory cushions for kids that have difficulty sitting still. Now, if we have fidgety kids, we probably also have kids that struggle with procrastination. And for that reason, I love timers. I'm a huge fan of timers. I've used them for 20 years. 
I've used them for kindergartners. Um, I use them a lot for college students. Nobody is immune to timers, even adults. I use them for myself all the time. So here's how you use, you can use a timer two ways. Let's say your child is a real huge procrastinator. And you know, on Wednesday, if there's like that teacher work day time, and you know he has to get something done, and no matter what you say, he's having a hard time getting started. I would pull out the timer. This one at the bottom is one of my favorite ones. It's called a time timer. And you, can, you might be able to see behind me, I have a big one that I use for display. This is a little one. It's about this big and you can buy it on Amazon. But they're very inexpensive. But I like them because this red disc is moving and that really, really helps kids with elapsed time. So you set it for a super short period of time. Take your child's age and add one. So for like a 10 year old, you might put it for 11 um, minutes and you say to your child, I want you to focus as best as you can, as much as you can, um, focus as, um, work as hard as you can just for 11 minutes and then you can take a break or keep on going. We do this with kids over and over again so that they can eventually do it on their own. So we'll kind of model the behavior and we'll say, I'm gonna work as hard as I can, as best as I can until they can engage in that same self-talk and set the timer by themselves. So you might have to show your child how to use the timer at first, but then I would just leave it in their study area in, in it's theirs to use as they need it. Now for older kids, um, they may need to work on something for far more than 11 minutes. But here's the thing, many times, uh, you know, a lot of middle and high school kids will say, I'm going to work, I'm going to finish this up for an hour and a half, but our brain cannot sustain focus for that long. We know through lots of research that actually there's a sweet spot for older students and adults. Um, and in fact, researchers looked at, is it two hours? Is it a half hour? Is it an hour and a half? Like, what is it? And we they found that it's actually 25 minutes. Your brain sustains the greatest attention and the greatest focus and the greatest motivation if you set a timer for 25 minutes and not more. So for older kids, we'll often teach them, you know, you really, you need to do this math assignment, you don't wanna do it. You can either set it for a short period of time, or if you think you can sustain longer, set the timer for 25 minutes. And that's really um, the length of time you wanna do. So the, the method is called the Pomodoro technique. There's lots of research on it if you wanna look at it. But the idea, even for adults, is you never want to do four Pomodoros in a row. So you set it for 25, 25 break, 25 break, 25 break, 25. Um, and that's how you get yourself to do something that you really don't want to do. But for younger students, we only set it for 25 minutes one time. And then for high school students, they might do it a couple times. But four times is really for adults. All right. So definitely kids need a focus tool. Um, definitely kids need a timer in their area, but they also need to take notes when they have to retain information. Enter doodling. I used to think that kids that were doodlers in my class when I was a teacher, um, they weren't paying attention. And I used to say things like, pay attention to me. Look up here. I'm doing this lesson. You'll need to know this. It's really important. Put your pencil down and listen when they were doodling and drawing pictures. Um, turns out studies show that actually doodlers have better focus and retention than non-doodlers. So when kids have to learn something in class and their teacher or on Zoom or you know Blackboard, whatever, and their teacher is lecturing, they need a, they need a structured way of taking the information in. Now, it used to be that when kids took notes, and we did this for many years, we teach them different note taking techniques for using blank paper. It turns out our brain doesn't really think like that. Our brain compartmentalizes information, which kind of makes sense. So these are doodle notes. This is the, like the modern version of taking notes. And you can see the, the structured format in these notes. If you look at the bottom right, you can see blank ones, and these are templates. You can get these for free on teacherspayteachers.com. I love that website. And just type in free doodle notes. You can learn all about doodle notes on doodlenotes.org. And they also have some free templates too. But what I love about doodle notes is that once kids write down their information, 
they can color it with their erasable colored pencils and make it their own. They can make it pretty, they can draw pictures to help them remember. And because it's so attractive, they're more likely to go back later on and study the information, which is the most important thing. So some other ideas for focus. When your child is getting ready to go online in the morning, make sure all the other windows that he doesn't need at the bottom of the screen are closed out. Ideally, we want our kids to have their phone in another room. This is easier to do with younger kids that might have a phone, like a sixth grader. You're gonna have more control. It's harder when they're 17, so it may not be a battle that you want to, to, want to fight. But if you have control over it, ideally for the main subjects, their phone is in another room and they can get up during breaks and, and check their text messages. If you're really struggling with your child's media use, I'd say the majority of the families we work with use Google Family Link. Google Family Link allows you to put limits on your child's usage by app. It also allows you to put overall time frames for usage on their phone. But what I like about it is that your child has to allow you to do this with their phone. And this is where their really good discussions take place. This is way better than going behind their back and putting all these restrictions or just saying something like, I've had it. You're on your phone all the time. I'm taking it away from you. By talking to your child about it, you're more likely to get buy-in. And you can say things like, I've noticed you're on your phone a lot during instruction time and I'm concerned. Can we talk about this? So ideally, you know, we really want to get our child's buy-in for most things that we do. It's ultimately our decision because we're the parent, we're the adult, but if we can talk to our kids about it, um, it makes it more likely that they're going to see our point of view and follow through. So even things like, where do you want your setup? If we say, listen, you're gonna work in here and this is how we're gonna do it, it, your child may be resistant because it's only your idea. If you say, listen, Jimmy, I was just on this webinar with this lady who said I should get you all these fidget tools and this timer, I'm buying all this stuff for you and you're gonna use it. <laughs> it's likely you may not wanna use it. So before you run out and buy a bunch of things, show him a few things that you have in mind and say, this might work for you or this might not. What do you think? Would you wanna try this one out? So again, getting our kids buy-in is ideal. All right, routines and schedules. As I mentioned, the backbone of our day-to-day -day living. <laughs> and routines start out with, what we do in the morning, which can honestly be the toughest part of our day. I like to use the words I've noticed when I want to give feedback to a student. I use I've noticed a lot with my own kids and I found I find they take the information better and they're more willing to listen because it doesn't feel confrontational. So you could say something like, listen, you don't get up on time and I'm tired of it. Um, you're going to set two alarms. You need to have them set for 7.30 and 7.35 and blah, blah, blah. It may not go over well, but if you take the other approach by trying to get your child on your team and saying something like, I've noticed we do better with routines, the same thing day in and day out. So you're not saying you need to change, but you've noticed something. I think I've noticed are kind of like magic words. You might want to say, Based on what you know about yourself, what would be a good time to get up each morning? If you've been struggling with this over the past week, you can say, last week has been kind of tough. I've noticed that getting up has been tricky. Based on what you know about yourself, what would be a better time to get up? So you're just posing the question. But in general, I try to avoid why questions when I work with students, because when I say things like, why didn't you get up on time? Why weren't you logged in on time? Why didn't you turn this in? It's so hard for kids to know why. They, always, they don't always know why. They're having to take lots of feelings and information and synthesize it down to an answer. It's often easier if I say something like, um, you know, what happened um, before that occurred? You know, you're asking something very, very specific. Um, I noticed this didn't get turned in. 
Um, tell me what happened when you went to upload the file. So those often are better questions that kids can easily answer. So part of our routine, in addition to obviously getting up in the morning and being online, is discussing the daily schedule. I recommend taking just two to three minutes in the morning, make sure your child's schedule is printed out, and say things like, oh, tell me about your first class. What do you have today? What do you have after that? You might even ask, oh, what do you plan on doing for lunch? Or how about your breaks? Those simple questions get kids thinking ahead. They kind of fire up their executive function skills. When typically kids just think about their first class and not much past that. So I would recommend that each morning your child has a schedule printed out. And as she or he goes through the day, she can cross off each class as she goes. If you have really young kids, they also really respond well to a, work, to a visual. And after they finish that class, make it a big deal. That's awesome. You just finished your reading period. Give them a sticker, draw a star, whatever it is. But it's kind of like a to-do list for little kids where they see they accomplished something and then they get a little bit of a reward for that. So that morning conversation is super helpful. I just mentioned breaks. Breaks can go one way or another. They can be really positive because our brain likes downtime and it's important for us to reset. But on the other hand, if kids are utilizing screens not for the right reason, it can make breaks not so great. So activities that are really hard to stop can seem addicting to kids during break times. And these types of activities would be video games, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. These high um, valued activities to kids produce tons of dopamine in the brain. And when we get a huge amount of dopamine from one neuron to the next, this receiving neuron says, I want more, I want more. So the minute we say to our kids, hey, put TikTok down, it's time to start your next class, this receiving neuron says, wait a second, you've given me so much dopamine already, I want more, you can't stop. So that's why it's often hard for kids to stop that and start something else. However, there's other breaks that also produce dopamine, but just not the, um, the huge amount of flow where they have to have it. And these would be things like going outside and riding bikes, arts and crafts, maybe playing with a friend, building with blocks. Whatever they do, um, getting away from a screen is really, really important with these breaks. And a lot of our kids, their natural reaction is to stay on their screen. We want them off of our, their screen. And ideally, we want them outside. You know, movement is so vital for our kids, but they often resist it. It's kind of like, you know, an object in motion stays in motion, um, but an object at rest stays at rest. When our kids are at rest, their, it's their natural reaction to want to stay like that. But we want to get them out of the house and um, get their blood moving and, and get them unstuck. We also want them connecting with other kids. Kids look forward to connecting with their peers. So if they can have lunch together, um, a virtual lunch, if they can study together during their downtime or in person after class, um, if there's a mutual interest, it doesn't always have to be in person, but they can have get togethers later in the day. I've talked to lots of kids that one girl um, is really interested in crafts and um, she does a scrapbooking kind of thing. She has another friend who also is interested in that. So in the evenings, they'll both, they kind of do it side by side, even though they're virtually virtual, they both get out their scrapbooking things and then they do it together and they talk about it. So that's another way, interest-based, getting kids um, to socialize with one another. So we talked about that routine in the morning. We talked about checking in right at the beginning of the day. I also think just once a week, even for five minutes on Sunday nights is really helpful to think about the week ahead. If kids are just thinking about their day, it's a little bit short-sighted. As they get older, we want them to think about what's further out. So if it's Sunday night, we'd like them to look at what's due the rest of the week. So you can say things like, oh, tell me about your week. What do you have coming up? 
You might even say, what's your priority for the week? Or do you have any tests or projects, any extracurriculars? Don't ask them all this at one time, but maybe ask one question and see what they say. Now, if you are a person that really likes to know about your child's grades or you want to go on the homework portal a lot, I would recommend doing this with your child at a time that you set aside to do it. It's better to go on with your child because if your child got a low grade or maybe they're missing an assignment, you can see what it is and so can they and they can explain it to you. And that's better than if we check it on our own, you know, and the first thing we say is, hey, Susie, why don't you turn in that math assignment? You told me you did it. Right away, that feels punitive. But if we look at it with our child and we say, oh, I noticed there is a math assignment that hasn't been turned in. I didn't say, you didn't do a math assignment. I said, I noticed there's a math assignment that hasn't been turned in. That's an opportunity for her to tell us what it is. So this conversation shouldn't be punitive. It's really just kind of finding out what's going on in class. And then lastly, <laughs> I think this is the most important thing. We want to preserve relationships with our kids. And this can be difficult when we're always together with our kids 24 seven. And it's especially difficult if we're working parents. So if we're working from home, how do we make this, how do we make this work out? We always wanna make sure that schedule, as I mentioned, is printed. If you have a younger child again, make sure you have stickers nearby that when they're done with the class, you reward them for doing a good job. If you have another adult in the house, designate a go-to person. So for example, you might say, look, Emily, I'm your go-to person from nine to 10. If you need anything, come get me. Dad's your go-to person from 10 to 11. Go see him if you have any difficulties. But if you decide to do this, make sure it's in writing. Because kids, if it, it's gonna be in one ear and out the other. They don't respond well to verbal. They're much better with visual. So get a dry erase board, get really cute colors, make it look pretty, and make sure it's in writing who goes, who's the go-to person when. I've always, I've always thought that a visual trumps a verbal. Same with when we're working and we cannot be disturbed. There are some times we're on a conference call, we have a deadline and we cannot help our child at that time, even if they need our help. So we can do this a couple of ways. We can have a system, I call it the red green light system, where red means I'm really busy, I can't help now. Green means come on in, whatever you need. And if you wanna get fancy, this is kind of like a nice to have, you really just need red and green. You could have yellow. Yellow is come on in if you really need help. So you want to take a piece of construction paper and put it on the door of your office. If you don't have an office and you're working at a table, you need some type of visual. It can be a Sharpie. It can be a cup. It doesn't really matter. But if you decide to go in this direction, practice it with your kids. Make up scenarios. You can even say something like, let's say I have red on my door and you see me on a call and you and your sister get in an argument because she's being too loud online. What do you do? And play the role. It's so fun. Kids love it. But it's a way to practice it. So on game day, they really know what to do. And then lastly, probably most importantly, if you found yourself in power struggles with your kids in the past, where um, there's constant friction over grades or incomplete work or um, whatever it might be, you feel like you've become the homework police, that's a sign that maybe you should focus on completion and not quality. That means you don't worry about misspelled words. Are there enough adjectives in a sentence? Is there an incorrect math problem? It doesn't matter. Your job as a parent is to make sure your child is up on time, they're dressed, <laughs> they're sitting at their computer on time, they're logged in, and as much as possible, they're engaged. And they've turned in their work. That's I, the most important thing, that they're following through and turning in their work. But the quality, leave that up to the teacher. That's her job. Plus, she needs to know if your child is having difficulty. So to really reduce power struggles, especially if you're a working parent, focus on completion, not quality. When you have older kids, the truth is you're not gonna be able to micromanage because they're too old. They wanna be independent, 
they want their privacy, and it's just not going to go well. So there's probably some degree of negotiation. I really like the blind eye strategy. Here's how it goes. Listen, Ethan, I'm willing to turn a blind eye to you watching Netflix late at night if you're willing to get up on time and be logged into your first class on time. So now it's kind of a give and take. You're, you're not gonna micromanage or nitpick that he's up late. Honestly, it's hard to, it's hard to make that go away. Um, I use blind eye a lot with my younger son, who was a senior last year, and he wanted to do it his way and that was it. And so that's how we kind of got through the year where I felt like I still had some rules, but you know, I was willing to not pick battles because it, it never really went well if I was always the enforcer. And then lastly, you know, family dinners, and even though we feel like we're with our kids all the time, taking time to not talk about school is ideal. Family dinners, even if they're just a couple of nights a week where we talk about different things that aren't related to grades, have you turned in any assignments? How is science going? Who would you have lunch with? Those things don't matter. If you're stuck with how to have a great conversation with your kids, I recommend thefamilydinnerproject.com. If you go to thefamilydinnerproject.com, you'll see lots of conversation starters and fun things to do at dinner, whether you have a preschooler or a high school student. Um, it, just really unique, neat ways to get kids talking, especially for our really reserved kids. And then lastly, reaching out for help is really important, not just for us as parents, but also for kids. And in fact, in talking to um, my tutors that help kids with subjects and our executive function coaches um, that are teachers and asking them, what do you think is the most important thing kids can do this year in your classroom to stay engaged? And they said, they've got to ask questions. They've got to stay connected with me and they've got to reach out for help. So if there's anything we know, um, it's that our kids have to be engaged. They can't sit on the sidelines, they have to be a player. So that might be um, raising their hand or private chatting the teacher. If they're really stuck and the teacher is an email person, help your child to compose an email to the teacher to say something like, hi, Mrs. Smith, I'm really stuck with reducing fractions. I'm not sure how to do number three. Could I talk to you after class today? How about three o'clock? The reason I like helping kids with that initial email is that they're likely to get a positive response to te the teacher. And once they do, they're more likely to reach out for help again. And getting them in that habit of asking for help at the very beginning of the year is key so that they're not hesitant to do it. And when they're hesitant, they're, you know, this can last a long time. So we wanna get them out of their comfort zone early on. Now, as parents, we need to also know when to ask for help. So here are some hallmarks that I see with kids over the years. I've had my business 22 years. Um, there are certain times you need help and others you probably don't. So if you've seen that your child has struggled with keeping up, just staying organized, turning in their work, um, being able to set their priorities, being able to plan ahead and reduce procrastination, have basic study habits, um, and be able to study for tests efficiently, things like that, those are executive functions. Although they tend to get better a little bit with age, if your child struggled with them in the past, they're probably gonna do, have that problem even more so with virtual learning. So if that's the case, they might um, benefit from a coach. If they have subject issues in a cumulative subject where one skill builds upon another, you, you should always reach out. So like math. If your child's having difficulty with math and has had difficulty in the past, it means that because math is a scaffolded subject where in the beginning they have to have these basic skills and they build upon them, if they're weak here, all of this is going to be so hard for them. So if you see your child st struggling in math, a math-based science, when they're in high school, a foreign language, reach out to the teacher right away. Uh, it probably won't get better. No amount of saying to your child, study harder or um, pay attention more is gonna make a cumulative subject um, any better. So make sure that you reach out for help and encourage your child to or get private help if you need it through a tutor. So um, 
if I had to put everything together and think about what is it um, we need to do to get started to have a great year, it's to make sure we have a really good designated workspace set up. That's step one. Step two would be opening up the dialogue with our kids. So each day, just checking in, oh, tell me how your day looks. Each week, let's talk about what you have coming up this week. And then lastly, preserving relationships, and often it's by prioritizing completion, just getting it done, over quality and perfection. So um, if you weren't with me when we started, I wanted to mention that I put all this together in a virtual, uh, in, a <laughs> in an ebook for you called Six Tips for Smoother At-Home Learning, even when you're dreading it. And you can get that by texting 55444 and the word virtual. Um, so Kathleen and Kelly and all the parents out there, I'd love to open the chat right now. If you have a question, just go to the chat box and, um, send me a message and please make it so that it's to everybody, not just panelists, but everybody can see your question. That's always helpful. And if you want it to be a private question, just send it to panelists um, and I will answer them as we go. So somebody asked me earlier, is this going to be recorded and sent out? And the answer is yes. I will um, make sure that you get an email tomorrow with um, the link to this recording. And also Kelly and Kathleen, I know that you um, shared information in the very beginning. And if you look at the chat parents, you can see how to reach the Parent Resource Center, their email and phone number. So I don't see any questions, which is unlike parents. <laughs> I'm wondering um, if there's a question that I can answer from you at this point. And if not, we can call it an evening. So one mom says, what can a parent do when a middle schooler just shuts down when a parent tries to discuss executive functioning strategies? If you're middle, here's the thing about middle schoolers. Middle schoolers want their privacy. They, they feel like they can be independent even when they have difficulty with it. Um, so often they need the help, but they're not willing to admit it. So if your child's really resistant to you helping, I, you have two choices. Either leave it alone and say, look, I have faith that you can do these things. If you need me, I'm going to be here and available to you, you know, during the day. Come get me if you need help. Um, if you don't, then I assume that you're okay and you can do this on your own. If you see though, when kind of left to their own devices, your child's really struggling to follow through, that's when I would reach out to somebody else and ask for help. So it could be from the teacher, it could be from a college student that lives down the street, it could be from a professional executive function coach. Um, but I would say if, if it, that your child's continue to struggle with it, look, I can tell that you need help, um, I'll let you pick the person you work with, but I think it's important to make sure that year goes well in this unusual circumstance that you have somebody by your side who can support you. So again, probably disengage at first, and then if your child does need help, reach out. All right. Um, oh, that's great, Kath Kathleen. Thank you. So YouTube will translate this into different languages. Awesome. Okay, great. Oh, thank you, Kelly. I didn't even see that. So we have a question in the Q&A. Um, if you notice your child is disengaged during a class, should you step in and remind them to focus? I might do it once in the beginning and say, I noticed. I noticed um, that um, the class isn't, a, isn't of great interest, something like that, and let your child talk about it. You know, they might say, yeah, my teacher is so boring. And then you might say, oh, what do you think you might do to help you pay attention a little bit more? And then if he says, I don't know, you could say, would you be interested in the fidget tool or, you know, whatever it is, just kind of have a discussion with your child. But in general, I don't think it's our job as parents to constantly be um, watching after our kids to make sure they're focused. It's going to drive them crazy. They're going to end up in huge power struggles with us. It's going to drive us crazy because if you're going to start to think this is our job, to keep our kids focused and it's not. 
So you might even ask, I got this from um, a behaviorist, Sharon Weiss. I thought this was brilliant. She has the strategy and she asks the kids, um, how many reminders do you think you'll need from me? So you're, let your child set the reminders. So he might say, I don't need you to remind me, remind me at all. He might say twice, he might say once. So you stick to it. So if he says, I only need two reminders, that's it. Two reminders during the whole day is all you remind him. But in general, I would not um, be making sure he's on task throughout the day. And I'd also send the teacher an email and say, I noticed that Jimmy is having a hard time focusing. Do you have any strategies that make quite work for him? Because if she has a great idea for Jimmy and she says it, that's going to be more powerful than you say it because kids will often respect their teachers more than a parent. Unfortunately, <laughs> I find the same thing with my own kids. All right. So let's see. Um, let me go back to the chat here. Um, how can a parent cope with the changing demands from Arlington? For example, today in, in the middle of, in the middle of the day, there was a more, a new requirement to be done by four. What is the play? way to raise the issue with school and teachers. Here's what I think. This is not unique to Arlington. Um, I did a webinar for Fairfax County on uh, Friday and same issues. And what I said to the parents there is give it two weeks, like really give this some time. This is new to all of us. Like we've never as parents been in this situ situation, as educators, we've never been it. As administrators, we've never been in this situation. So I would give it a little bit more time um, it also shows our kids that we're having a little bit of patience with the school system as they go through this. My experience has been that everybody wants to do a good job. We want to do a good job. Our kids want to do a good job. Our administrators want to do a good job. We're just not always sure how to get it done because things are so new to us. I've seen just in the last few days um, that teachers have been doing a better job because they're learning from experience from day to day. What if your children demand to have tech time, post-school, and homework time? It feels like it's too much screen time, but at the same time, they deserve it for being focused. How do you best deal with this? All right, here's what I would do. So when the day is over, I would let them check their, if they have phones, I'm fine with them checking their text messages. Um, if they don't have phones, because they're really young, I would send them outside. Make them get outside, and engage in some form of exercise. They've been sitting for way too long during a day. In a real school, they walk between classes. They walk to lunch. They go outside for recess. They go to PE. They have all these breaks during the day. They don't have that now. So I would just say, look, I know you want downtime, but go outside first for an hour and then have a time that they can they can have their electronics and I'd probably do it later in the day. Um, if you say when you're done with homework, you can have Xbox. You got to know they're going to finish their homework in like three minutes because they just want Xbox. So for that reason, you might say at five o'clock from five to six, you can have electronics, something like that. But I might push it to later in the day. The other reason is because we're going to have daylight savings time soon. And when it gets darker, earlier and earlier we want our kids to be outside and not playing on games um, when they could be experiencing some sunlight any tips with dealing with asynchronous mondays for a first grader who does great the other four days but has trouble focusing on the day where there's no interaction in the direction yeah you know i was talking to a parent about this today too um it's actually she works in my office i have all moms that i work with that answer the phones and talk to parents and one of my employees has four kids. The other one has um, two kids, both of whom have an IEP. And it's really, really hard for them. But what I will say is it's going to get better. I think teachers are just starting to figure out how to make Mondays work. And what I saw, at least, I live in Fairfax County, when they sent out the directives for what kids should be accomplishing on Mondays, it was beyond what is developmentally appropriate for them. And I think we'll start to figure that out. Like a third grader is not gonna be able to sit for two hours and do all this stuff. It's just not how their brain works. So what I would say is um, 
always set, use timer, set the timer for 25 minutes. Um, do not expect your child to go longer than that. It's just not going to happen. Um, and even a first grader is less than that. I'd also set up stations, kind of like the Montessori approach when kids are, I don't know if you've ever seen Montessori classroom, but it's this type of education where kids go to stations. So they might have like a building station, a reading station. Um, they might have like an arts and crafts station for fine motor skills. So for a first grader, you might have a little setup where you might have like tell her to get all of her books and make like a little library station. Maybe she has her math book and some math manipulatives and on a table and she has a math station. And so on the asynchronous days, um, let her get up and move between things. And you can even use a timer for when it's time to move. Um, difficult matter. I try taking my son's attention for something else, riding a bike, for example. I think what you're saying is um, that's a great way for kids to get out and do something is riding a bike. In fact, I was reading, I think that's what you mean, an article in the post the other day. And this mom said, um, she's actually the author of the article. She said her son just, you know, like the minute he gets off of school or he has a break, it's like his natural inclination to just stay on a screen. And she just said, I'm not, this is not negotiable. And she said, you cannot do this. You have to go outside and do something. And she put his bike in the garage and she said, go take a bike ride. And he came back, even though he, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's dumb. He did. And he came back and he was in such a better mood. So sometimes when our kids are like so stuck, We've got to just push them out of our, their comfort zone, like walk a dog, walk one of the dogs. Um, it can be like, look, I'm going to take a walk with you. You don't have to talk to me. I'm going to listen to my podcast and you can listen to your music, but we're just going to take a walk even for 20 minutes. I think that's, that's a good piece of time too. All right. So let me go back to, that was in our chat. See if there's any more Q and A. I don't see any more Q and A. So um, I think that's it. And if you have any other questions that are personal, I'm happy to answer them. And you can send them to me at my email. I'm, I'm really fast in email. I have parents ask me stuff all the time and I will promise to get back to you quickly with a personal response. My email is Ann, A-N-N at ectutoring.com. So I hope all of you found this to be helpful. Um, I think that it's gonna be a better year as time goes on. I know it's hard now. But I found that already it's gotten a little bit better. And um, I hope that it gets better and better for you each day. So thank you so much for coming. When I close this out, you're going to see a survey come up. And I'd be so, so grateful if you could tell me what you found helpful um, in this webinar so I can make sure I'm focusing on the right things. And just take two minutes to answer the questions at the end. Um, and that will help me for the future. So again, thank you all so much for being here. It was a pleasure to see you. And I wish you all the very best for a great school year. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.